Um, kind of have a lot of content in here, and I've given this talk a few times, so I've tweaked it because some stuff seemed a little boring and some stuff seemed missing, so I've taken stuff out and put stuff in. So I don't know if I'm going to run out of time or not. So I'm just going to I'm just going to try to go through pretty quickly. Um, so this uh, this is a tale of Agile and Drupal 8 and a client that uh, my company, Last Call Media, did a project for, for Rainforest Alliance. And uh, this was really, we've, we've been working with them over the years, we've got a great relationship, a lot of trust. And uh, they came out of a rebranding initiative, um, which meant there needed to be a redesign of their website with a refreshed communication strategy. So it was time for something new to do with their content. And, um, Drupal in general is, uh, has a nice focus on structured data and this fit well with their need for portable and searchable content. And over the years they've built up this nice collection of, of really structured, nicely tagged, nicely organized content. Uh, so Drupal has, has been, they had a Drupal 7 site and Drupal 8 would continue to serve that well. Um, they also, in their new communication strategy, they also um, had this idea of uh, kind of a related content engine that they wanted. They wanted people to be able to um, browse content but also have access to like, you might also like this information so people could really get immersed in everything that they do and learn about all the, all the work that they're doing. Uh, so Drupal 8 uh, um, has some nice opportunities for us to integrate with Apache Solar to, mm -hmm. to leverage um, so the content relation engine that, that is provided there. Um, and uh, they also had a requirement, not an immediate need, but they wanted to start um, having more of a workflow for others in their organizations to be able to submit certain content. And Drupal has always had a nice workflow, uh, and there's a, currently a workflow initiative that's, that's progressing along nicely. So it wasn't quite there when we started this, but we knew that it would be, and that it would be easy to, to set them up with that. So all of those things added up to, for us, especially with our experience in Drupal 8, we felt comfortable recommending that rather than doing this whole redesign in Drupal 7 later to have to upgrade them to Drupal 8, we just did it in Drupal 8. Uh, it was within a year of, of Drupal 8's release. So it was pretty early. Uh, not, nobody was really doing Drupal 8 sites. So we, we got a head start on that and that was very exciting. Um, so we had agreement um, that this should be uh, done with Agile. There were some reasons for this. Um, there was a four month timeline. By the time that this project got to the let's go phase, they had a hard deadline of uh, mid-October because of some internal campaigns that they do every year. So they really wanted to get this thing together and have it in place for October. So we had to commit to meeting that deadline in some form. And Agile was a good way to do that. We could describe why that is and we'll talk a little bit about why that, might, why that would be the case. Um, and they also had a budget that really only allowed for six sprints. So fortunately, six sprints fit nicely into the four-month timeline and it fit the budget. So we were able to have a fixed timeline and a fixed um, project budget. Uh, and so the one that you can't have, if you have two, you can't have all three. The one you can't have then is scope. And that was okay because not all of the requirements were known at the outset and many things they wanted to see how things were working so that they could you know maybe change directions or maybe do things a little bit differently so the story or the explanation of why you would do something as an agile project really fit really nicely with where things were at with this project um, so but first uh, who here feels like they know what agility is okay so a little bit a little bit all right and I should have asked this uh, first, like maybe by a show of hands, who's interested more in the Drupal 8 content of this talk? And the Agile content? Okay, all right, so split pretty much even, so I'll do my best to, to go back and forth uh, to go with the, I'm really glad to see that there's an interest in the Agile content. Um, so, what is agility, right? So. Agility, what I like to think of as lowercase a agility, is uh, adapting to change, right? So this requires an awareness. So you can imagine, you can imagine a superhero, 
who maybe is known for their incredible agility, right? And they're in a battle with a bad guy. And all of a sudden, a surprise punch comes out from the side. They're, they might have a heightened awareness because they're a superhero. They're aware of this punch. Their agility is what lets them not throw the punch that they're about to throw, but to duck instead. Mm -hmm. That means they have great agility and they can respond to change. And that requires an awareness, right? So this applies to much more than just software development. This is just applicable to your life in general. So anybody who's had to change their plans for some reason has experienced agility. You know, sometimes it doesn't feel like you're being very agile if you're planning on going to the dentist and then you have to reschedule, you know, it's a little slower paced. But it's all kind of on a scale of agility and that requires awareness. Um, a lot of people, uh, capital A agility, I think it's a bad name because it's a bad name for various reasons that I'll touch on. Um, but in general, agility is good, right? So this is a quote that I like by Charles Darwin that talks about that it's not the most intellectual of the species that survives, it's not the strongest, uh, but the one that is able to adapt and adjust to a changing environment. So one that has an awareness of, of the environment that they're in and can adapt and change and, and, uh, and meet whatever the changing needs that it finds itself in. So we did this in six sprints, so that would be six iterations. And uh, how are iterations agile? Uh, I believe that iterations are agile because they aim to provide an optimized awareness into a larger effort. And awareness enables agility. So what I mean by optimized awareness is you commit to a chunk of stuff that you can get done within a certain period of time, and you want to get it to a shippable increment. So an increment that you feel pretty good about, that you feel could get shipped if the client really, really wanted to ship it. So you're trying to get it to this point that's not busted, that has, uh, has the quality of something that somebody could review and give some feedback on to say like, okay, I see this working and it's the right direction to keep going or it's, it's what we wanted but we see now it should be a different direction. And you can get, you can give the client an optimized awareness into the, into the uh, status of where the project's at at that time so that they can really make decisions and have that agility. Maybe, they, maybe it's a punch they, that they need to see coming before they, before they get to the end of the project, right? And, and, and other types of software development, you typically don't get to seeing the punch coming until you've already invested in the whole entire project. You know, probably as part of that big end of project QA phase that, that people used to do. Um, so when, uh, so really with the lowercase a agility, understanding this awareness, how the awareness enables, uh, enables the agility, an understanding of that is what lets all, uh, all of that, all that understanding, any method that you can do that has that aspect to it, uh, comes together to form kind of a capital A agile uh, project or practice. So. So Scrum is a kind of a framework to work within where every piece of it is for bringing awareness in, in, some, in some way or another so that you can be agile. Okay, so alternatively, you can uh, do a lot of planning up front. I think a lot of us are familiar with this and it still, it still happens. There is a, there's a tendency, there's a desire, there's a comfort in trying to plan everything up front, right? So you have this project, so with Rainforest Alliance, we had this redesign, and there was an option for us to go into planning mode to figure out what were all the things we we're gonna do, what were all the things gonna look like, do the, the mock-ups and everything, and get it all like planned and specced out, um, spend a lot of time, this, uh, this typically happens in uh, discovery uh, phases or planning spec phases of different kinds where you're doing you know, only information architecture, just planning, specking. Um, a lot of people that can't let go of this desire uh, to do a lot of planning up front will, and, but still want to do agile, will do something that's called sprint zero. Right? So this is like, okay, well, well, we'll do agile, we'll only do sprints, but sprint zero is the one where we just do all the planning. And that's not really, that's not really agility. Um, and I best understand um, this tendency, this urge, by reflecting on the, the following familiar statement. 
You never get a second chance to make a first impression. So I think that this is something that drives that tendency, right? Like we, we don't want to launch something that, that fails, so we need to plan out every single thing, okay? Um, so, so like when, if, if you have a lot of pressure that failure is not an option, you just try to plan your way out of it, right? So but if you plan for too long and you never launch the thing or you launch the thing really late, then there's not much difference between failure and not launching. You still don't have something that people can use. Uh, so, um, let's see what I have here. Okay, sometimes people feel like they want to make, they want to plan it so it can be perfect, right? But perfect can be the enemy of the good. So having something launched that's good is really good because it's good and useful rather than something that's going to be perfect at some point, at some time. Um, it's better, better a diamond with a flaw than a pebble without. Okay, so here's a nice perfect pebble. You know, you'd rather, I think you'd rather have a diamond with a flaw. Okay. So large, basically if you do a lot of planning, what you're gonna end up with is a very large release, right? So you do a ton of planning and then you have a ton of stuff to build that you're then gonna build it. And then it's this big, huge thing. And there's uh, a lot of risk with having a very large release. You've got more effort invested in all the planning, and if it turns out that what you release is wrong in some way, then, you, then there's more to be wasted there. Um, any large release is going to have more work put into it, more changes done, so there's more risk because the more that you put into it, the more bugs there could be. So when, if you deploy something that's very large with a lot of changes, there's a lot that could go wrong with that rather than comparing that to deploying something that's more of a smaller little feature, right? So you can imagine this is what leads to those very large QA phases, very tense, like we're going to launch this rocket to the moon so we need to plan everything out kind of environments around launching a website. Um, and this, this typically comes into play when everybody's just ready for it all to be over, right? You hit this QA phase and that's when you find out about all the bugs and the bug list just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And this is basically when everybody wanted to be, the project to be over, but now they're getting piled on with these surprise problems. Okay. So going the other direction, this is often the direction that people take capital A Agile often, right? They think this is permission to not plan, okay? So what can, be, what can go wrong if we don't plan? So if you don't plan, aside from the obvious things of just making mistakes because you didn't think or deliberate on what might be the right thing to do, you could, um, you could get a false positive on your initial release because it, be like it could be less than, it could be kind of a bad version of what you think could be a shippable increment because you didn't put any thought into it. You want to put enough thought into it so that you can release it and get feedback in a, in a meaningful way. So if you don't plan at all, you're going to release something where you get bad feedback, right? So you might decide, this is a failure, let's just abandon this. We did a little bit amount of work, we released this product and it didn't get a good response, but it might be because you didn't put any thought into it at all, right? So it could be a partially developed product or design, and it, uh, you've shown it too early, basically. So it's risky to do that, right? And you also build up design or uh, kind of debt in, in your thinking, right? You've cut corners in just how you think that thing should work. So you could end up wanting to do something different later because you didn't think anything through at the outset. You now come run into a problem. So, so the question is then, how do we plan enough but not too much? Um, and actually, when, when am I going to run out of time here? Uh, 12.35. Okay, we're good. All right, so you want to, so it's really important. So I'm a real believer in Agile methodology, but you need to make sure that you plan, but don't plan too much, right? So one of the ways that we did that with the Rainforest Alliance is we did a collaborative backlog building with them. Is anybody uh, familiar with Scrum terminology? Who's familiar with Scrum? So in Scrum, you have some roles like a product owner or, and a Scrum master, and you have uh, the project will have a backlog of, of basically here's what we want to do. All right, and so you, you figure out what are all the things in my backlog that I want to do. Um, and we built that and we groomed that with the client. So grooming means 
that you kind of refine things down and detail things out. And I like to think of it as making each item eligible to go into sprint planning. So when you're gonna start a sprint, there's a planning session where you decide what are we gonna to commit to in a sprint. And in order to commit to getting something done within that sprint period of time, it needs to be understandable. You need to know what you're committing to so that you can truly commit to it and take responsibility for doing that thing. So backlog grooming is getting items into that ready for sprint planning state. And we did that with the client. So a lot of it was uh, agile coaching on what a good user story is. And you know they didn't do the best user stories, but that wasn't, that wasn't the priority. The priority was to get what the needs were out so that then we could work on them you know, the, during sprint planning or during, you know, during refinement and grooming. Um, so they did a lot of uh, epics and user stories and, and they picked it up pretty quickly. Uh, it took, we were doing uh, a, like a coaching session with them one, sometimes two days a week and it took a, a couple of weeks you know, first the user stories were kind of way off the mark, and we were able to say, well, maybe if we said this different thing, or what did you mean by that? And it took, it took a couple of weeks, and then they really got the hang of it uh, to a point that was really useful. And once we had, once, once we were all feeling pretty good that this backlog is a pretty good list of all the things that we, that we think, you know, would like to get developed, fleshed out and developed, uh, we went on site for a two-day collaborative kind of guesstimating because it was very important to them since we knew that it was a six sprint budget. Is it crazy to think, right, that we can do this work within six sprints? We needed to have a sense of will it all fit? So one thing that humans are really bad at is planning, something that they're even worse at <laughs> is predicting the future, mm -hmm. right? So how do you know if it will all fit? So it almost is like, this is meaningless. Well, no, we can't predict the future, we can't know, let's just move on. Mm -hmm. But you still have to have some sort of, like, some sort of guesstimate, something to, like, to start with that you can then change as you learn more. And Agile, doing, doing an Agile methodology is, is designed with that understanding that we're gonna, it's okay that we're going to change this later because we're going to learn more and the more that we become aware of, there may be the, the right thing to do may change and that's, and that's agreed upon by everybody that this is important. So, so we, uh, we took all of the epics from the backlog doc and put them on, had them put them on note cards and then we did a, like a planning poker, um, estimation poker with them where where our, we had a subject matter expert, a uh, Drupal developer, um, a Drupal grandmaster, actually, if that, if that mean, means anything to people. Um, he quickly, because he was part of the backlog uh, development and grooming, so he quickly went through each one and just kind of wrote like super safe guesstimates on the back of each card. And so then we, I, I held up the card, you know, could have just been something huge like the home page. And you know, what do you guys think this is? So they, they all guessed you know, in, in like hours or days or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I would say what, what he guessed. And at first it was wildly off. And then they, what they started to get, I think they started to pick up like what his kind of strategy was. So if it were like a, like a profile page, they were like, oh yeah, so profile pages are an eight. So this one's an eight and it started to align. So it wasn't super accurate, that wasn't the point. What the point was, was that sometimes we'd put one up and they would say like, oh, that's a 40. And he would have wrote a four. So it's like, let's talk about this one. Or it could have been the other way. Like they would say like, oh, that's a four. And we would be like, oh, we put 80. And then it's just, <laughs> then, then we would find out like, well, we know we talked about this thing, but it doesn't need to do all that stuff. So it's just like, okay, so we would kind of refine what it meant. And we went through everything and got further alignment on, which, on basically the size of each backlog item. And what that allowed us to do was what we um, figured out what size, what capacity we had per sprint, and we put a number on that. And then we were able to say, well, we need all these cards. These cards should not add up to more than that number per sprint. So we were able to pile up the cards into basically sprint piles and, to, and, and in this way we started forecasting out 
what could we possibly fit into Sprint 1, and, and we could even have conversations about if we do these things in Sprint 1 and 2, that's going to set us up to do these things more easily in Sprint 3 and 4 and whatnot. And we ended up making 10 piles. So one of the important things of this part of the exercise was that it brought the concept that not everything's going to fit. Right, in a very collaborative, meaningful way. Right? The, we have these physical cards, we, have, we can only do six piles, here's pile seven, eight, nine, and 10 of stuff that we'll have to do later. Right? We only have six piles, so then you know, a lot of the cards that were super important to them at first suddenly became, well, get, let's get that out of the first six months. So we were really able to focus on the most important things that could fit in the first six, and kind of give us give ourselves some room, you know, to because if we we gave ourselves some room because if if there was more time to do things, we could start pulling things from that kind of overflow of cards, and so then we digitized the uh, the the card piles. So this is where the text is small, but I'm pointing to Sprint One. And then there's some stuff that they made that, w that cards were made for that we didn't want to lose track of, but that we were just going to do across, you know, just in general. So there's some interesting stuff here. And uh, this, this screenshot, I think, was taken at the end of Sprint 2, so that's why we have some technical debt basically documented here that we put in there. But each one of these rep represents a card, and the numbers here are the numbers that we collaboratively guesstimated on just to get started. Um, and each one of these items links to the, the heading in the backlog Google Doc that we built out and groomed with them. And so we were able to, um, and, and these, these numbers, we have the target sizing up here, um, and we get a total, uh, a total sizing on the top right. Um, and you can see that they, we, they, we worked with them to generously leave some room in here. And all of this, Sprints one and two uh, stayed pretty much the same, but three till the end drastically changed over the course of the project. And that fits with, I like the word forecasting because everybody's familiar with the weather forecast, right? <laughs> so you get a weather forecast and, you know, today and tomorrow, probably true, probably true, but you get three, four, five, six days out, it's anybody's guess. So forecasting is a good word to, to gain alignment on the reality of how projects go. Um, so let's see. So Agile doesn't tell us not to have a plan, but to always be planning. Right? So that's really important. Right? So I think, I think a lot of times you may have had an experience with Agile where it's just chaos. People can change their mind at any time. And we can just adapt because we're Agile. And uh, really, I think if you're doing it right, you're planning a lot more. You're just constantly planning. You're constantly looking for those points of awareness. You're meeting quickly, but more frequently. Just getting a, getting a sense of where everybody is, working together, and planning and replanning, and figuring out, is the right thing to do next still what we're doing, or should it be something else? Because you don't want to go in the wrong direction for any amount of time. So some examples of Agile planning is uh, you can have some pre-sprint grooming. So you can have a quick meeting to, uh, you know, so say before the first sprint or even during the first sprint before the second sprint, you could have a quick meeting at the end of the day on like a Thursday where you get the sprint team together with the product owner and maybe the stakeholders if, if it feels like they might have a, a good knowledge of things that, that the uh, product owner wants some help with get everybody together and just quickly go through the list to get some of those initial questions out of the way that could be quickly answered. Uh, and basically optimizing the list of forecasted items for that sprint, optimizing them for a really solid sprint planning session on the first day of the sprint. Um, so that's a form of planning. And then you have the sprint planning session which happens the first day of the sprint that you've optimized yourself for with this pre-sprint grooming. And you plan out what you're going to commit to in those in those two weeks, right? So you ask all the questions to make sure that you understand it completely, so that you can truly commit with all that you are that I am going to do this because I understand this and I've had my chance to ask all the questions. Um, 
And then since we have, since we've built out this, this forecast spreadsheet that was a, a slide ago uh, or so, it makes sense to reforecast that way. <laughs> we did a reforecasting after the third sprint because we, because the team had gotten in deep with all the tasks. They knew just how things, you know, better sense of how things were going to go. They could weigh how we we could weigh how things had actually gone against how things were originally guesstimated in that two-day on-site collaborative guesstimation, and start to kind of calibrate how things are going to go. And um, and I have I think I have a slide specifically about that, but. Once you get a sense, uh, you reforecast, you have a better awareness of how things are going to go. You can decide to move things out of the sprint to make more room, or move things closer so that they you don't run out of time to do them. So you're, you've gained awareness. So it makes sense to adjust your forecast. You wouldn't go by a weather forecast from three days ago. You want to go by the one from today. Um, and at mid sprint releases. This is, I think, what happens as you get comfortable. All, everybody's comfortable on the team, the stakeholders, the developers, everybody's get, gotten comfortable with the project in a way that waiting a whole two weeks to the end of the sprint just feels like, why? Like, why are we waiting so long, right? And so you can have these, these faster releases, especially when you've laid a lot of the groundwork of the uh, large bits of functionality so that really more of the tasks that are left are the smaller tasks then you can polish them up quickly and just release them for review. So you get more of that, one of those mid-sprint releases and that, and every time you do that, that's an awareness moment because you've released something so people can look at it. And then you can replan things or change your plans a little bit. So a lot of planning going on. Here's a daily stand-up on this project. Everybody that was on the project was in the same location, so we went a little old school. You know, whiteboard with the sticky notes, you know, so, and so there's some explaining and self-assigning and, and getting a bunch stuck in the, in the daily stand-up, which about 10, 15 minutes. Um, here's, a, here's a sticky board, so we've got the to-do column and people self-assign themselves into the doing column. And there was a little bit of a review workflow, kind of on, you know, during the sprint, kind of QA and documentation happening here, rather than waiting all the way till the end to do it. And then th this eventually, this would be all the cards. Um, the, these were cards. So this isn't standard over here, but these were cards representing all the epics that were forecasted. And the team liked this to be able to kind of this this is this is was a physical representation that maintained the overall project vision, which I think is important to, to not lose sight of. Um, so, I was the product owner and uh, an agile coach on this project, and I kept a product owner journal where I kept track of the daily standups, what was committed to each sprint, what was done each day. Um, what the sticking points that came up were, what the resolution was, and this was really important to be able to go back to uh, from time to time, but it also let me, um, it gave me a reason to keep track of stuff that would lead to something useful like this cool uh, build-up chart. Has anybody seen a build-up chart before? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so a build-up chart is here's time, and this is a build-up chart representing six sprints and I like I like to have it represent the, the whole project if possible unless it's a really long project then you might have to do something different but this blue line across the top is the estimated project size so you can see here after we reforecasted and at the end of sprint three we figured this project's a little bigger and then as we went across sprint four we worked with the client to pull some stuff out so it got a little smaller and then as we were feeling good about ourselves across Sprint 5, we added some more things back in, and it, and it got a little bigger. Um, this, uh, so, so this red line is just going from zero to the estimated project size. And this orange line is each, each uh, estimated task gets estimated points to go with it. And when it's completed, it, get, it bumps this orange line up. So this, uh, the build-up charts, I think, end up being almost like a project fingerprint, right? So each project only happens a certain way, and so this is very unique to this project. Um, or like the rings on a tree to tell how old it is. 
But you can tell some things about this, pro uh, about this project just from this chart. This looks like, a, like either a new build or one where substantial pieces of foundational or large functionality are being de developed. You can see this in these kind of bellies here where like you commit to a whole bunch of things, but in nothing, no story or task is getting to a shippable increment very quickly. And it's not until you start running out of time that you tie up whatever loose ends you can tie up in whatever way you have to tie them up in to get it to that shippable, reviewable state so that you have this like sharp uptick at the end of each. Um, and then you can see in sprint six how pretty much all of the major functionality got in place and we were really able to go into polish mode and we had those quicker, quicker releases and things were getting to done much more quicker, much more quickly. Um, so that, I really, I really like the charts. It's hard to, it's hard to feel like it's doing anything because you just have to track and track and track and track and track. But then once you can look back, it's, it's meaningful information. So. I'm going to try to touch on quickly a little bit of the Drupal stuff. Um, what am I doing here? 12, 30, okay. Uh, so basically, this so this is the this is the forecast. Um, I think this is a snapshot of it from the uh, end of Sprint two, but I'm going to use this just to refer to a little bit about how we decided to do this project and kind of call out some Drupal aspects of it. Um, one thing that was uh, really important to them was a pattern library, and so this was the, uh, an idea of having you know, atomic elements, design elements, that then get reused elsewhere to the point where you can have like a library of all these things, like here's what you know, the different headings look like or the different buttons look like, and some headings and buttons can be combined into some forms, and you know, you have a form and something else on the page, that's, that's another piece, so all these patterns build up into larger pieces of the site. And uh, this was something that we thought was a good idea, so we started work on that right away. But, um, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll say something about that a little bit later, because that comes in big at the end of the project. But we did, we chose to do, the reason why we chose to do articles and videos and uh, featured header content, those were part, kind of part of like general layout stuff, is that was so that we could get them adding content immediately, right? So these were, these were a couple of content types and how they would look, and then, you know, we've got the navigation in place just to kind of get, get a shippable version of the site in place so that if they wanted to, they definitely weren't gonna want to, but if they wanted to, they'd have a, a navigation with a logo and everything could be an article if they really needed to ship the site at the end of the spring. So that was what is meant by a shippable increment, right? So it, it was not gonna be the case that they would ever ship something like that. But if they wanted to, they could. So we built out these content types and in building out these content types, we had to get lay a lot of groundwork, a lot of important stuff. We did, we used page manager and layout plugin and panels. Um, and so page manager is a great tool for making it easy to create specialized landing pages. Um, and then we combine that with the layout plugin and panels um, to provide, uh, to use different layouts when viewing different uh, node types. So this was really the foundation of the kind of the theming of the site and how the different pages were going to be built. Um, and we were able to um, use Page Manager to handle all of the different full node displays. So it gave an interface and a content management kind of way of, of building out and handling those things. And that was very, very useful, very easy to do in Drupal. Um, we were able to lay the groundwork for uh, media handling. Uh, media handling has really come a long way in Drupal 8. It was, it was really nice to work with. Um, so we used uh, media entity. Um, uh, mostly for that and its related modules. Uh, the project had a requirement that um, they wanted to be able to, any piece of media, PDF or um, image, they wanted to be able to upload it and not ever have to upload it again. And in addition to that, if it were an image, they wanted to be able to upload that and associate all sorts of different things like captions and where it was, so really each, each piece of media had to be uh, had to have a lot of structured data, metadata attached to it. It was really important to them, and it had to be reusable. 
And so the uh, media entity and its related modules really, really came together nicely, it, almost like that's the point of it, to kind of be like a digital asset management for them. So they can just add their stuff, and then as they're building up their content, they can just pull it out of the library. Um, and, and that's actually the, uh, the next thing. The en we, for that, we use Entity Embed, Entity Browser, and Inline Entity, entity Form. Um, so Entity Embed let us add new buttons to CK Editor so that they could uh, choose those buttons and through Entity Browser kind of browse through basically their digital assets um, and choose which ones they wanted to show, reuse them. Um, and uh, Inline Entity Form lets you do that workflow, but if it doesn't exist, you can create it. So it was a really nice editorial experience to be able to have this live, be able to add to this library and reuse things from this library. And if things weren't in the library, you could create them right there and then choose them. So this was this was a big deal, and it was huge to enable them by the end of the first sprint to start adding all their content, all their articles and videos. You know, so well that's another interesting thing. That was an epic, the migration of content from the old site to the new site. So each type of content that they had in the old site going into the new site, there we had an epic about, well, we may need to migrate this. And and those things got pushed back because they thought like, well, worst case scenario, we have a team of people, we can do this by hand, or you know, we can select, you know, some of it it was a hundred pieces of content, some, you know, all of the ones that were like a thousand pieces of content we included because we have to programmatically do this, that's what just makes sense. But once they, once they saw or once we got it so they could add content and, and what it was like to add content, it, a lot of, there was a, a lot of relief that it was going to be nice, a nice editorial experience to just add this content and it also gave them an opportunity to do something that they had to do anyway for different reasons which was basically touch every piece of content, touch it up, they, they were adding a lot of new uh, features that was going to require them to kind of retag things or change things. So it was nice to give them a way to just start working on that. And what the developer the development team really liked about that was we were always, from Sprint 2 on, we were always working on a site with real content. Mm -hmm. So we were able to, they, they were able to see, we were able to see if some of the content wasn't quite working in a certain layout and they were able to redesign some things. So it was really important that, uh, and it was really great um, that you know Drupal made it so that we could do this very very early on. So Sprint One was a, a very a very important sprint. We also got features off the ground in Sprint One. I'll say some things about features. Uh, Drupal's configuration management uh, initiative solved a lot of issues around managing configuration. Most of them, almost all of them, anyway. Uh, which was how everybody's used to um, working with features, to make features do that configuration management in Drupal 7, 6 and 7, for example. Uh, so Drupal 8 solves a lot of those issues, but one of the problems that we ran into is if you have everything in configuration management, then you have you know, like stuff that should only be in development. Right, so we had to we had to back off that a little bit because you have you end up with like uh, CSS aggregation, page caching settings, uh, special development modules that you kind of want excluded from just being you know ending up on your production environment because you're just importing and exporting configurations around. So we used a lot of features like we know how to do, um, but really more in a way that features was meant to be used and we left the true configuration management stuff to CMI, but we used features for um, shipping our actual features around. Uh, so that was a big deal. Um, okay, Sprint 2, this was the sprint that we, so the, re, so the reason why we wanted some content in place is because Sprint 2 we were forecasting some, you know, um, having a related content engine. We did a lot of Apache Solar work in Sprint 2 to do our advanced filtering. The latest listing page is basically this section of the site that lets you filter down in um, um, like a drill down. I can't remember how, what the, when you drill down to things. Uh, 
what type of filtering that is, but faceted searching. It's, it's basically like faceted searching, but the interface doesn't really look like faceted searching, but you're, you know, you're able to pick what type of content, tags of the different type of content, then the further item, and it just filters it down and down and down. And um, so we had the content to be, to be able to build that and have real content show up in there. And with the related content engine, we used Apache uh, Solar, uh, more like this uh, functionality, and with a custom block, we were able to um, leverage that functionality with our own boosting criteria that we worked out with the client because they wanted they were you know it was very specific about the, what pieces of content they wanted to show up related to other pieces of content, and getting this in place early was really important because each sprint, as more functionality was built out, as more content was added, they were able to see well why isn't this piece showing up. We need to tweak this boost criteria because we want this one to show up in this in this case. Um, so it was good to get that done early on. Uh, we also did more of the the media media refinement. Um, they so they so focused primarily on their images because they wanted to be able to upload images that would have captions and different things about that image, and then that image, the way it would display, it would display some or or all of that uh, metadata, um, depending on where it was shown, what, what context it was being shown in. And we were able to use a core, Drupal 8's core view mode system um, to set up multiple displays for each media type. All right. And then, uh, so we had that stuff in place. And Sprint 3 ended up being quite a bit different than what's shown up there. But um, we, the big thing that we did in Sprint 3, actually, um, yeah, Sprint 3 ended up being different because uh, some of the technical debt from the first two sprints caught up with us. So the team committed to quite a bit less in Sprint 3 so that they could work on having a more polished release. So they really only, we really only did the home page and the content hubs in uh, Sprint 3. So the content hubs are uh, content that they had categorized by a region or by an issue. And so they wanted for there to be these specialized landing pages for what essentially was a taxonomy term. And uh, Panelizer was perfect for that, for letting us basically have paneled versions of that where they could add custom blocks to it to build out very specialized landing pages per taxonomy term. So that was a big, so that was the big Drupal piece that we did uh, as a part of Sprint 3. And so here's just a quick little screenshot of uh, this is a in-place editor, you know, see, so, so you get this, you go into edit mode, and you get this dotted line around your different chunks of content, you can move it or edit it. Here's a, a more confusing thing, you know, typical Drupal with so many options of what to do, um, but, you know, they were able, we were, we were all able to get our heads around different pieces of this and make it work. So it's pretty cool to have. Um, they, they, they have, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, is it seven or eight? Eight. This site is Drupal 8, yeah. So, um, so they're, uh, so they're a little bit about Rainforest Alliance, the team we were working with. Very smart web team. They, they manage their own web stuff. They call us for the heavy lifting in, in, in this project. So this was really something they were able to, to get into and tweak and feel like they had control over stuff. So this is managing the content in a layout, uh, editing different pieces of it. Uh, so it was nice to, nice to get that in place for them as, as site builders. Um, so the next uh, quick direction I want to go with this is, um, so you can see, maybe you can't, but if you had um, binoculars, you could see something at the end of Sprint 3 here. We didn't quite hit our target. Um, so like, like I was saying, Sprint, uh, Sprint 3, we, they committed to less, so there were less points to earn, basically. And while this ended with a really nice polished version of things that had been committed to in Sprint 3, everyone in the project knew that not as much done, not as much as everyone was hoping to get done, got done. Um, so we did a lot, so you can see here, this is an updated uh, forecast spreadsheet. We did a lot, there's a lot less things in this column. Um, we, there were, it was, the, the results were great. Air, sprint three, sprint review was very impressive, but then when everybody took a step back and thought like, 
well, a lot of stuff got bumped out of that sprint because of that. Are we in trouble? Okay, so, so the project sustained some emotional damage at this point, right? And so if you think about the emotional cycle that every project goes to, this is kind of the idea of it, right? So, so you haven't started yet. You're neither optimistic nor pessimistic. You get started, there's this honeymoon period of certainty. Okay, time goes on. It's actually a lot of work. And then something happens where, you know, basically you start coming up against reality. And the reality is, is that you couldn't predict the future. You couldn't know how long something's going to take. You're not going to be able to get everything done that you had hoped, right? And so then an experienced team will know that the goal at this point is to get from here to hope as quickly as possible. Right? And so that comes, you develop a lot of techniques and I think every time I try to come at this new with, how am I going to skip this? <laughs> and I don't think you can skip it. Because I think if you skip this, then somebody's paying too much for your time. You've been, you've been asked to do not as, you know, not as much as you could. <coughs> Somehow this was just too easy, right? So if you have a team that's really trying to do as much as possible, you're gonna run into that part of the project where you realize you are doing as much as possible and these other things aren't going to get done. And that's when, if, you can, if, you, if you've had transparency and collaboration the whole time, that's when you can all get real together about, yes, we are doing as much as we can, we are doing the best job that we can, and we need to reset our expectations and be reasonable, and here's what we, sh here's what we should expect to do, and so you reset expectations and you start accomplishing that re according to the reset expectation, and that's when hope starts to, to creep in. Um, so I put I uh, put that overlay just over top of this graph just because I think it's kind of just drives the point home, um, right? So so here's where the doubt started to creep in, and then we did really great at the end of sprint five, but we still quite quite hadn't had that conversation about how there was still a lot left to do, um, and so we did at this point we did you know get real about what was left to do, and then it did, it also helped that this was like basically the last huge piece of functionality and we were really able to rapidly release things every couple of days <coughs> across the two weeks. Um, and I, that was really satisfying and a big relief. And this is really, this is actually really where the pattern library came in to play because if you can think about a pattern library of things that show up all across the whole entire site, right? If that library is at some iteration of itself, less than perfect, the site across the board is going to look less than perfect. And for someone who doesn't understand how that's put together, they just think they have a completely busted site. It's just totally overwhelming. This whole site is busted every, everywhere it could possibly be busted. And so once we got into this uh, kind of a polishing sprint, you know, a, a, a more one of the final iterations, we were able to fix up each one of those patterns. And each time we, we perfected a pattern, that fixed it across the whole entire site. So the site really just rapidly, visually, started to come together. With, without, you know, we didn't have to like burn them in on oil, we just had to you know, fix up these little, bring, bring these little pieces the rest of the way uh, in this final sprint, yeah. Uh, why there is some, some time between the end of sprint four when you guys uh, <coughs> said that it's gonna take less points and then the whole point that you mark at the end of sprint five? Could you, Le less time yeah. or yeah, S sprint four seems like you guys had hope at the end of sprint four, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> I had hope. Okay. <laughs> I I had I ha I had hope the whole time. Um, there so since the project had a lot of trust, they just they were just kind of like, we hope this is going to work out. You know, hope this is. I don't know if this is answering your question. But, um, you know, so basically Sprint 3 happened and we confidently were saying, well, this is how we're going to keep, you know, we're reforecast and this is going to work. And even though we hit our target on Sprint 4, that just didn't magically solve it because there were still things that didn't, that, that got pushed out. Oh, you know? okay. So we hadn't had that conversation yet that no, we're actually not going to do those things because we ran out of time, mm -hmm. right? So, that, so there, there wasn't that like, um, let's all come to reality moment. 
that and, and realize together that we had to push these things out and we have to focus on getting the things done that we can. And those things you pushed, were they a part of the minimum viable product? They, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing where flexibility comes in when it has to, right? So they were, you know, so one, I think a good example is there's this, uh, there's this press page section. And so internally, this press page section, it, it was kind of promised and sold, like this is gonna be great, we're gonna have this in our site. But when it got down to, you know, we're gonna run out of time, can we launch without this? And what came to um, everyone's, what, what came to the, to the forefront of, of everyone's understanding was that this press page didn't exist yet. So nobody was going there or expecting it to be there. It was just a new thing that had been promised. So they, it, you know, we, so now it just becomes like, well, we have to say this is getting pushed off because it won't fit. So there were a, a few things like that. Um, and there were enough things like that that, um, that yeah, we, I mean, I could, I, I, I could imagine a situation where it's just, no, there's too much. And then you have to look at, well, like, do we change the, the, due date, the uh, launch date or do we, come up with a static page that will represent this, or you know, what workarounds can we, can we figure out? Um, I have another question. Yep. Um, so towards like the later sprints, when you were sort of working to fit in more of this stuff from the earlier sprint, was the team working like more, like to kind of make those commitments? What was the sort of like, like 10 hours a day more? Like, you know, I'm just, I'm just curious, like, what did that, did that also correspond to people just like, kind of going above and beyond as far as the amount of time they were putting in to make more things happen in the final sprint? I think, yeah, I, well, I think that by nature of trying to release them every couple of days, there were just more eyes on it, more attention on it. So I think one thing that happens if, if somebody has like two weeks to do something, they kind of go off in their corner of the office and work on it for two weeks. But we were trying to, you know, have these little releases. So there was more like, hey, I'm looking at this. How's this doing? You know, what what's going on with this? So, and then we would release it, and they would look at it, and then um, they would have feedback on different things, or, or nope, this piece is still broken. We kick it right back to the same person. So it was it was faster paced. Yeah, I do think that. Uh, so I I think that. I think that, oops, I think that had this project had like, you know, seven, eight, or nine sprints, they all would have looked just like this, and it would have just been like very high energy, fast paced, very productive. Um, but it's it's hard to do that when you're you know getting solar built out, yeah. or getting all of Drupal's foundations put in place, um, or you know getting a home page together. Uh, you mentioned the client had a, an internal team. Yep. Were they uh, actively programming and developing alongside you, or did they have a, a parallel path or something else? There, I would say the makeup of their team is um, content management and like front end. Mm -hmm. So they played. So a lot of the uh, pattern pattern library specifications came with HTML that we didn't reuse wholesale, but you know, they they did some coding. So they. They did a lot of the front end uh, coding of the patterns in uh, UI kit. So they, they had some UI kit. Uh, they had some Envision stuff. We didn't really, for they, they wanted to know at the outset like which tools should we use. And in Agile it's more important to collaborate than pick someone's tools for them. So they had Envision, they had UI kit. Uh, they, they mostly used UI kit for, for coding the front end stuff that then we could be informed by when we put it through Drupal. And you were managing their their work as well throughout this process, or like communicating. Yeah, I mean, they would as they would gain awareness and how the project w was going, they would like go into their own thing and, and do some redesigning designing different pieces and do some coding. And so they would come to us and say, "Hey, this is how we want those filter drop downs to look," or like the filter drop downs actually didn't have a style until like this until the sixth sprint when they styled it and said, "This is what we think it should look like." So I wouldn't say that there was really any management going on. And actually, on, on an Agile team, you're supposed to be self-organizing. So everybody has their skills. And, and it's really more about each person needs to understand what they're committing to and to self-assign and commit to that. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully everybody finds a way to pull their weight. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to jump into, I'm actually going to skip this piece a little bit. But you know, some of the challenges are, 
uh, that came, well, actually, I'm not going to skip it. I'm just going to do it really fast. Um, so one of the challenges was that uh, we didn't communicate well enough um, in the coaching of how this project was going to go in an agile way. We didn't communicate well enough that the team wasn't committing to the design specs, right? So they weren't committing to, we're going to make it look exactly like that. What you really commit to are the stories, basically the functionality. We're going to make it work like that. And it's going to look as close as we can get it to this design comp or mock-up or specification, right? We're going, the design spec is the, is, you know, the goal and we'll get there hopefully by the final iteration. But iteration one, it's not going to look like that. It's not going to look like that necessarily by iteration three or four. So that was something that we didn't have the alignment on that we thought we did. So when it got to you know sprint five, and we had that talk, they their feedback was had they known that they would have done things a little bit differently um, because they were expecting. You, you're, the team committed to this piece of functionality, but it doesn't look exactly like the design. So then it was like, well, they're, we're not committing to making it look exactly like the design. We're, get, we're committing to it working like the functionality that the design is talking about. So if I were to do anything better on my next one, it would be to, to cover that base. Um, and there's also a challenge of the tendency to want to get everything perfect during like QA, right? So you start pixel pushing, and that's going to get in the way of, of an iteration, right? That's going to delay you getting to a shipment increment that can be reviewed and get feedback on. So it's important to, to tone down, to not do the, the pixel pushing perfection, um, and to do that iteratively. So there's a con conflict there. Uh, one of the challenges is being real about technical debt, right? So technical debt is you might, a shippable increment might be 85% done. And then you move on to the next batch of stuff. So your technical debt is that 15% that you decided to live with for, a, for an iteration to be finished later. And after time, you've got 100% worth of stuff to do with all those, all those smaller percentages. Um, and coming out of a, a, you know, a waterfall software development model where people are used to being promised exactly what's going to happen for an exact amount of money all the way up front, then the, the, the uh, development team is expected to pay any technical debt because they promise to do all of it, including any technical debt that arises. But in an Agile project, it's, it's tangible when the technical debt builds up and you suddenly need to take care of it and it's, it's forcing you to move things out of your sprints. So you can feel like this technical debt is impacting what we, the stakeholders, wanted to get done by sprint six. So in a sense, they're paying the technical debt by being able to do this. Um, so that's a, that's a challenge. Um, but it's a reality, right? And it's, there's the, the idea that um, in Agile, where you're trying to be as aware of reality as possible so that you can do the right thing next, reality wins. Reality is what guides you. So technical debt is a reality in getting ship of increments to bring that awareness to do the right thing sooner. You have to pay that technical <coughs> debt, and that's, that's part of what comes with it. And the expectation meltdown is what happens when you're when you're deep in that despair in a project, you know that's when that's when people have a lot of expectations and they're having to kind of grieve the you know the fact that they're not going to get that stuff or I mean the stuff that you'd hope for you're not going to get it, and that can be an emotional time, right? And so sometimes people can treat each other like maybe they're not doing the best they can, like they could have done better. You know, maybe they were they're they're sloppy. You know. It can be the case in, in, in during this time in, in any project where, where people can be a little disrespectful. And uh, a skilled scrum master should be able to hold the team together, client side and, and internal, to guide, to guide through this, uh, this, this, this um, despair moment to, to hope. Um, that would be done by using an understanding of at agility, the realities of agility, and the scrum values, which is another talk that I give but doesn't get accepted to camps, so I don't. <laughs> um, so reality will always win 
but are you really on its team, right? It wins, but sometimes you feel like, yes, reality wins, and uh, yeah, I'm on the side of that, but other times it, it, it wins and you, you feel a little beat by it, so. So with my, oh, I'm, I'm out of time, actually. But I, I would, I could run, talk more about this, just with, this is kind of more like a Kanban thing. Um, and I talked about the pattern library coming into play there, so I can skip that slide. Um, and we did that, the reason that was good is because it increased awareness during the final sprint. Um, oh yeah, so one thing that I will say is, um, since we went more into that can, Kanban continuous flow in the sixth sprint, where they were seeing it every couple of days, it, it really drove the point home that it's okay to do that when we did the final sprint review and it was like, yeah, we already saw all this stuff and we already fixed the bugs. So there were, zero, there were only three kind of moderate issues at the end of that sprint because we really had this collaborative polishing across the whole last sprint, so it really turned out really good. Uh, and since we were doing that with them continuously, you know, uh, we were answering and doing the training, all the whole project anyway, there were really only like three questions. It was very anticlimactic, right? Like it was like, here's the final thing, and, and it was just like, yeah, we've we've been looking at it. <laughs> you know? So it was like, we only have three questions. How do I edit this piece? You know, it's very small things, you know. Um, so here's some pictures of it. This is the, the home page. Here's a kind of a profile page of a species. A lot of the there are a lot of things that they write about to get this profile layout. Here it is on the phone. Here's a cool looking version of different layouts. Got some feedback. Um, we, their, their testimonials are, I think, my favorite. We've got, like, we've got tons of them. Like, you're making us look like rock stars. They're very, they're, they're, they're beautiful for uh, kind of testimonial blurbs. But um, yeah, I had some things I was gonna say here, but just check out the site. And uh, thank you. questions throughout, but is there anyone that has a question they'd like to ask Kelly? Yeah, yes. Um, I think the most important question about all those projects is the client commitment. Yep, that's and yes. And you mentioned a little bit about you being a product owner. Yep. Uh, I would like to know more about the client participation in all of those steps. Yep. So, um, in larger agile projects, there's a role that's referred to as the business owner. So they were, I, I was understanding them as the business owner role. There were, there were stakeholders that we didn't really interact with, so they were kind of, the, they were the representatives of the, of the stakeholders. So if I were the product owner, they were the business owner, and the product owner and the business owner worked together on the backlog grooming. Um, they were available for every um, sprint review and any sprint uh, pre-sprint grooming that we thought it would be beneficial for them to be at. They were invited to, they were able to join any stand-up they wanted. They, they joined a couple. There were a couple of stand-ups where we wanted them involved. It was probably sprint five, four or five, where we wanted them involved in it because we were trying to really figure out, like we're, we're running out of budget, we're running out of time, we want to really make sure that we're you know, on a daily basis making sure that we're doing the right things. Um, so, they, so they were involved, they were, they only came to a couple, three stand-ups in the whole project, uh, but they were at all the sprint reviews and, and maybe four pre-sprint grooming sessions. Physical, they were there physically. Remote, they're, they're in New York. Yeah, they're, they're based uh, in Manhattan, I think. Um, yeah, so they were like a Google Hangout. Actually, we switched to GoToMeeting because Google Hangout just is not reliable. Did that cover it? So audio, they were participating. Yeah, video, right? audio, video, screen share. Google Hangout's good for screen share. Okay, got it. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. My question is just the general um, awareness and accepting of clients to the Agile methodology, you find that most of your clients are kind of aware of it now, or is it still something that you're kind of getting their body in? What do you I find that there is a substantially increased level of awareness of the word agile, and that it's good, mm -hmm. or that it's the right way to do things, but really kind of not really any meat to, to that, 
Like, what does that mean? What does it mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I went to the Acme Engage conference where it, it was just a buzzword. Agile is just a buzzword. And, and you could have walked away from that conference thinking that Agile and Cloud were synonyms of each other. Mm -hmm. just, but, right, really like, how it all works and what the reason is for, for like no, not going the, the wrong way for too long or do you, like, well, here's, a, here's something that came up. So as I was kind of explaining, like teaching them how we wanted it to go and why it was important, um, the idea of user testing came up. And so they, they, they wanted to do user testing, so I thought, well, we can try to forecast these sprints so that maybe you can get some user testing in like sprint three or four. And someone on, on their team said, well, isn't that dangerous? What if the user tests test it and they find out that it's not, what if we find out it's not good? And that, you know, what if that delays things? And so the, the agile answer to that is like, do you want to find that out in sprint three or sprint six? <laughs> right, so, so you need that awareness. So there, I think things like, like that are, aren't really um, proliferated across the understanding of IT. And in terms of the, uh, the financing of the project and their you know, um, how, how does it go in terms of, you know, people may be expecting that they're going to do a watershed methodology, yeah. and so that, you know, they, that puts a lot of that technical debt on the part of the developer. So yeah. I think, uh, do you feel that, uh, you, have you found that that's been a relatively easy sell or hard sell in terms of taking people from how they would normally expect a it's project to develop to where, Hey, we're going to do this, and you know, you don't, we don't know exactly what you're going to get, but you know, it's going to be better. It all comes down to trust. Like universities, doing work for universities is just impossible. To run it through their legal team, and they just be like, it's well, it's not impossible because we do do it, but it, it it's a tricky situation, right? Because you're not you're selling basically people and time mm -hmm. in an agile contract. Right, and so you would put so an ag agile contracting is its, is, is its own topic, but you you basically say like, here are the sprints and the resources that we're going to work on, and then that that like laundry list of things that like maybe RFPs come from that becomes you have to make sure the wording is that this is the list of things that we will look to for things to do. If you don't want the contract to say we're going to do all these things. You know, not to mention that they're probably way too vague to right. say you're going yeah. to do them anyway. Um, so it's it's tricky. Because, but if you're trying to be real about that, and you have like on the other side of the contracts a sharp eye on it, it can yeah, it can be difficult. Um, it can be almost impossible. So it's it's really all comes down to trust. So they have to trust you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, but I had a question. Could you? Um, I was wondering how you handle the end of spring three when you go to present to the client and how you reassure them that you're still on the right track. I had a lot of things in my head of what I was going to say to cover that, but they didn't really they didn't really press us on it. Um, but it would, would have just been you know reaffirming that you know maybe we're going to have we might have to bump some other things or we have to reprioritize or look at what is left to do and look at what we didn't commit to and sprint to and figure out what things are going to have to be bumped. Um, so, pro I mean, it probably would have been good to force that conversation, uh, but they didn't press it, but we ended up having to have it in a much more tense way at the at Sprint 5. So, yeah, I think it would have been good to force it there. I just think that talking to the uh, concept of trust and setting expectations, with the uh, I guess my general question is how did you convince them to go without a defined deliverable, if you will, or scope? And did they have some expectation in their mind that said, okay, we're going to have to invest additional after this project anyway? And the, well, so I had been, this was a, a, a very large project and we all knew it going into it and I worked with them, consulted with them on, you know, kind of getting the budget that we thought would be the, the large amount. And so six sprints was much less than that. Uh, so we thought that there was like some room to cover that thing. I might have to ask you to repeat the first thing that, we, that you asked, but um, we believed that it was there. And then over the course of that time, it wasn't there anymore. The business did something else with it. So um, could you recalibrate? Did they, was, did they have, I guess, the expectations just in terms of getting them to have a defined scope. Well, usually with 
course, they want all three. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, so... The theory is reality. For this, uh, partic for this particular example, um, we had kind of an ongoing support relationship uh, on retainer. Uh, so if they, the way the relationship is, is that if we needed to figure out, if we needed to define the scope in a way that it was defined enough that we could commit to it, that meant more questions or more research. So it was a known issue in the project that not all of the requirements were fully known. And I think they, that was one of the places where we had, where we had alignment at, at just by default, where they, they knew they knew they didn't quite know, like they wanted something to meet this. And um, I, you know, in, in RFP processes, you all, you feel like you're promising this vague thing, but that wasn't a part of this relationship. So we need something like this. And we were able to respond like, well, we have a way to get started on it so that we can figure that out. So that's where the trust is huge. That has to be our last question because we're over we'll time. But if, yeah. if you see Kelly and he has a moment, he can. I could talk about this for four hours. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Good question. Great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um,